Well, welcome to the podcast today. My name is Jeff, and we have a returning guest with us, Dr. Scott Stripling. And uh, Dr. Stripling serves as the provost and director of the Archaeology Institute at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. He's the director of excavations for the Associates of Biblical Research at Ancient Shiloh from uh, 2017 until now. Previously, he directed several excavations, including the Mount Ebal Dump Salvage operation in December 2019 and January 2020. Stripling serves as vice president of the board of directors of the Near East Archaeological Society and has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, magazines, and books. He is a popular speaker at churches and conferences around the world and as a guest on numerous television programs and documentaries such as Fox News, The 700 Club, The New York Times, TBN, History Channel, and Discovery Channel. His passion is connecting the material culture of the Holy Land with the biblical text. Scott, welcome back to the podcast. Jeff, thank you for having me today. We are really excited to uh, talk to you about this unbelievable Mount Ebal inscription. And uh, we actually had Aaron Lipkin on just recently, and uh, it's great to be able to chat with you about this as well. Uh, while I was in Israel this March, I heard this exciting news that an amazing discovery was made during your direction of the Mount Ebal dump salvage operation. And so just talk to us a little bit, first of all, about what that is, where is it exactly and what material was being salvaged when this incredible discovery was made? Well, Jeff, to kind of cut to the chase, my goal in the project was to go back and to wet sift two dump piles from previous excavations from the 1980s, uh, one at Shiloh and one at Mount Ebal. And being an advocate of wet sifting because it's revolutionized the way that we're doing archaeology, but so few people are doing it, that was going to be my test case. So uh, that's how we ended up, you know, on Mount Ebal or with that material I was wanting to examine. We knew what Zertal had published. My field experience told me that there was more in the dump than what they had published, at least just for small finds like Bula and Scarabs and so forth. So that's what we did. We, we took Finkelstein's dump piles at Shiloh in the 1980s, Zertal's dump pile or a portion of it from the, the 1980s, and we wet sifted both of them. And we kept track, you know, through our protocols. And it was in that process that we found the lead tablet and um, we dry sifted the material again, like they had, because I thought it was very thorough, um, but they had missed it in dry sifting. We dry sifted it again and then washed or wet sifted the matrix that was left behind. So it was only in the washing in the final phase that we spotted it and um, immediately knew what it was. That's incredible. And, uh, you know, you talk about wet sifting and how it's revolutionized archaeology. We, um, we've, you know, as tourists taken groups to the, uh, to the sifting site near the Temple Mount. And, um, you know, actually on one of our trips had somebody make a fairly dis significant discovery, a coin. And I just think that um, this really is a, First of all, it's a fun way. If anybody's listening or, or watching and you want to come to Israel with us, it's really neat to get your hands dirty and, and uh, actually work with this with this material. But uh, also, as you have mentioned and uh, not just mentioned, but proven, it is an amazing way to find things uh, that were missed with the old process. Um, tell us a little bit about the discovery, this this lead tablet. So uh, Frankie Snyder was the one who, who found it. It was in her tray providentially because she was our most uh, experienced wet sifter, having been a staff member for 10 years at the Temple Mount Sifting Project. And so when Frankie saw it, she called me over. My heart started pounding because she saw what it was. I knew what it was. And then Abigail, uh, I called her over. She did too, because it's a known thing. Okay, these are called defixios or defixiones or cursed tablets. They're better known from the Hellenistic and Roman period. And so I remember right on the spot holding it in my hand for the first time. And I remember uh, telling them, you know, this is really important because it's a curse tablet from the mountain of the curse, Mani Bad, and it was found from the altar matrix. But don't get your hopes up higher than what they are, because it could be that it's from a later time period. You know, they're more common then. Mm -hmm. Let's just wait and see what we find out. 
So we left it in storage in Israel, assuming we'd be back in a few months to start processing. Well, of course, COVID-19 came along and we were locked out of the country. Right. And so there it was in storage. <clears throat> and finally, uh, five or six months ago, I was able to get back into the country and uh, we were able to get the tablet to Prague through the help of uh, my friends, we Konisberg, who kindly curried it to, to Prague. And um, it went through thousands of tomographic scans. Then the post-processing began. And in the meantime, I had formed a collaboration of scientists and epigraphers to work with me. And that that's then when we began to recover letters. And we realized that not only was it Hebrew, but it was archaic Hebrew. Uh, older than Paleo Hebrew, so it was quite exciting. Wow, that is amazingly exciting. Let me ask you just a couple clarification questions. Two things: one, you said you couriered it. Uh, you don't send something like this with like DHL or FedEx, do you? It, somebody carries it for you. That's right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wasn't comfortable. I really wanted to do it myself, but the way that it came down, I had so many things I had to do that I was fortunate. I had someone who was willing to do it for me. Perfect. Well, I just wanted to clarify that. And then you mentioned a term, uh, epigrapher. Tell our listeners what exactly is that person's role. So the epigrapher is an expert in handwriting. So it's handwriting analysis, essentially, because different font or style of writing is typical of certain time periods. For example, think of Old English, like Cadmon's Hymn, compared to Chaucer, Middle English, Beowulf, Chaucer, Middle English, to Modern English. You've got F's and S's being formed differently in different time periods. It's a telltale sign right. of that particular time period. So that's what an epigrapher does. But it crosses over into, into paleography because the paleography is dealing with the interpretation of the text. So uh, the epigraphy is literally the analysis of the text and the paleography is the interpretation of the text. Interesting. Now, We've had some uh, conversations on here about about Paleo Hebrew and these I, this idea of sort of word pictures or characters. You're talking about something that's even uh, prior to that, right? Uh, so the initial phase is when you have a morphing between hieroglyphic symbols into phonetic letters. So take the Aleph, for example. You have an ox head, uh, a well known glyptic symbol that begins to take on a phonic quality, what we would know as A or Aleph. So the ox head is morphing into an Aleph. And so we that's the development of the Hebrew alphabet before it standardizes. Hmm. That's what we have here. So it's the earliest form, which is typical of the late Bronze Age. So um, what we say wow. late Bronze II um, certainly begins in late Bronze one, And then what we have here is either the very, very beginning of Late Bronze II, as early as 1400, um, or down toward the end of it. To me, the epigraphy suggests the early end because we have those symbols known in, in the 1400s. So did they skip 200 years and there's still those same symbols in use, or do we see a continuity? So, you know, it, 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 we're, at this point, we're just comfortable saying that it's an LB2 inscription. Very, very interesting. Now, you you sort of referenced it lightly, uh, but but for our listeners, especially those who are, are Bible believers today, just talk about why this inscription and this find is so incredibly significant. Well, there's several reasons. One of the reasons that advocates of the documentary hypothesis have argued that Moses didn't actually write the Pentateuch and he didn't write it when the Bible says that it was written. The Bible was redacted in the Persian or Hellenistic period, you know, this whole train of thought. It's quite complicated, but one of the arguments that they make is that there was no alphabetic script. And so Moses and Joshua can't be literate, even though the Bible specifically, you've got God telling Joshua on Mount Ebal to write. So, you know, mm -hmm. it just, I guess it depends on how seriously you take the Bible as a historically reliable source presuppositionally. So it, it argues against that documentary hypothesis idea. Also, they argue documentary hypothesis theorists in most seminaries, liberal, mid-range, mid, mid uh, middle-of-the-road seminaries teach this stuff, um, that the JEDP sources were all redacted much, much later. So J being Jehovah, E being Elohim. And what they tell you is that they're hundreds of years apart. So this source developed, then 
two or three hundred years later, this source developed. And then later, hundreds of years later, they're all redacted together. The problem with that now, Jeff, is that in our inscription, you have Jehovah and El side by side. They're juxtaposed. So they're not hundreds of years wow. apart. They're at the same time. So again, this is difficult wow. to continue to advocate that school of thought in light of this, this new evidence. And then I guess thirdly is the idea that you have a curse, multiple curses, from the mountain of the curse where there is an altar built, as the Bible says. And then fourth and finally, you have the name Yahweh. You have the covenant name of God, of Israel's God, hundreds and hundreds of years before anything previously known in Israel. And when when you think about who worships Yahweh in the ancient world, there's only one group of people. And I laughed the other day when I heard mm -hmm. some critic of, of our find and of our work saying, well, you know, this doesn't prove that this was Hebrew. You know, they're overstating the case. As Shakespeare would say, methinks thou protestest too much. I mean, there's only one group of people <laughs> who worship Yahweh. You know? yeah. So he, they, they desperately exactly. wanted to be proto-Canaanite. That's what it's always been called. They've controlled the narrative. Uh, and I refuse to call it that. You'll notice that we have been calling it proto-alphabetic. But if you want to get right down to it, it's proto-Hebrew. And that's what, okay. that's what the fight's going to be about right there. Do you have a biblical text that is written when it purports to have been written? And if so, is it historically reliable? And if it's historically reliable, what are the implications of that? It's amazing. You know, we I mentioned that I was actually in Israel when uh, you guys did the press conference and I, I watched the press conference after the fact and uh, it felt like a big deal. <laughs> you know, it felt like this is very, very important. But, you know, like with everything, there's always, I guess, going to be detractors. There will be critics. There will be skeptics. Um, <clears throat> talk about how you respond to that and and uh you know do they have grounds for their skepticism maybe first of all i think skepticism is good i mean it's it's good <laughs> that that exists if not there believe me there's a lot of pseudo archaeology there's a lot of junk archaeology out there that i've spent my career refuting you know so mm -hmm. i think it's a good thing and i embrace that um let's just put it on a fair playing field, okay? Um, there have been a handful of scholars and critics who have, have made assertions that, you know, we're we're overstating the case and it can't possibly be this. And they haven't seen the actual uh, scans yet. And, you know, we shouldn't have done a press conference before. And it's just got a bunch of critical things. Mm -hmm. If you've been around for a while following biblical archaeology, you know that it's a contact sport, Okay. Yeah, And the maximum where there are two archaeologists, there are three opinions is a very true thing. <laughs> uh, when when Yossi Garfinkel re released the Kaiafa Ostrakhan, the exact same thing happened. I mean, they had their reading and then, you know, a bunch of critics are out there. Well, it can't possibly say this. It's got to mean that and yada, yada. So this is typical. Mm -hmm. But um, all we can do, Jeff, is having worked with it now for many months daily with, you know, world class experts, all I can say is to the best of our ability, this is how we're reading it, you know? And when we when we release the whole thing and all the scans uh, sooner rather than later, um, I'm sure there will be alternate readings of it because with that early text, as I said at the press conference, it is not standardized. Mm -hmm. It can be read forward or backward, you know, vertically or horizontally. And having grappled with all those nuances and all those complexities, all we are saying is, to the best of our ability, this is what we think it is saying. Right. But what no one will be able to argue is that it's not a late Bronze II text. So the idea of literacy um, at, at a biblical site, Mount Ebal, at a very, very early period, the conquest, quite frankly, that's, I think, without dispute. Okay, so the, the dating, the dating is solid. The dating is is solid. The interpretation, I think that there will be are every inscription there's ever been. There's been yeah. you know a multitude of interpretations. So I'm sure this won't be an exception. <laughs> hey, we have the Bible in English, and we still all interpret it differently. So uh, there's <laughs> there's right. a great example of that right there. Um, uh, this yeah. is it's just absolutely amazing, and I think that uh, your your arguments are are very convincing. I, I also you know just just the sheer weight of of this discovery 
you know, if in fact it uh, it does say what your experts are saying it says is is mind blowing to me. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, that that they're I mean, I just found out about uh, the fact that, you know, Adam Zertal found what he believes to be Joshua's altar on, on Mount Ebal. And uh, and now for this to come so closely on the heels of, of that revelation for me, I was a little behind the the uh, behind the game uh, in terms of, of knowing that. But 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 knowing that that place exists makes me a want to go there. But I know that that's problematic because of where it is right now. Uh, but also B think that that these two things together have to be have to be just incredibly significant. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, Zertal kept track of where they were dumping. All excavations have dump piles, right. you know. Um, the, my Shiloh excavation will become the first one to never have a dump pile because we wet sift 100% of the material. But every other excavation that there's ever been has had a dump pile. And so he said that the material from the altars, because you've got a, a round altar and on top of it, you've got a rectangular altar that's older. Most of the attention goes to the rectangular altar, but it's the earlier round one that's the the, the key. Right. What Zertal called the primogenial altar on Mount Ibad. But anyway, the, the material from the altar went into the east dump, and then the material from his area B went into the west dump. So we kept track because we did sift out of both dumps, but we kept track. One we called E, the other we called W. And so the, the tablet did come out of the east dump, which is the altar area. Wow. And I guess that goes that goes toward those detractors that that talk about you know kind of a lack of provenance of the actual material. Um, okay, I, I wish I wish I could talk with these guys because it's not to you know say that I'm right and you're wrong, but it's the answer is so simple, Jeff. Okay, there's only two choices. Right. Adam Zertal only had two strata, and so here are your two choices: either it's LB two or it's Iron Age one. Yeah. So there's no providence. How would we date it? Okay, you've only got a hundred year range to deal with there. Yeah. So choose where you want to be. Even if it's at the far end, it's still the oldest Hebrew that was ever found. So it's a straw man argument to say, I mean, if it was a multi, if we were at Megiddo or something, it would be a big problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have a very, very narrow range here that Zertal excavated. Yeah, that's great. Love your passion. And uh Tell me, is this is this discovery one of the major highlights of your career so far? Absolutely. It's, this is huge. You know, we're just honored and thrilled to have uh, been a part of it. You know, my focus has been on the highlands of Israel or the conquest sites. And so I've had the opportunity to excavate at four different conquest sites. And so it's terribly exciting to get a regional perspective. You know, we studied the pottery at each of these sites. And so you begin to see a pattern that is unfolding. But when you get text in the highlands, it's wet. So paper doesn't survive. So mm. a text is going to have to either be inscribed on pottery or lead or, or on metal of some kind. Right. And so here we have it. And for your Bible readers in the audience, look at Job 19.24. Oh, that my words were inscribed on a lead tablet with an iron pen. Okay. You see wow. how that's very characteristic. Um, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's the only book in the Hebrew Bible to not have a mention of the law of Moses. So here's your oldest book, late Bronze Age time period. And what is it talking about? Writing on lead. Very characteristic. Wow. Mind. So you see, Jeff. Mind happen. blown. Yeah. Well, it is, you know, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't sleep for days digesting all of this stuff. <laughs> but, but it's, uh, it's enormous in its ramifications. It really is incredible. And, you know, I've I've read through Job. I couldn't tell you how many times now I try and read through the entire Bible at least once a year. And uh, I just I never picked up on that. I'm going to have to go look that up. But isn't that how our, our minds do that, though? Right. Yeah. When we're reading. We glitch things. The next verse is like the first re mention of resurrection. Job 1925 is famous. You know, it's the first mention in the Bible of, of an afterlife. Right. Um but the verse right before it is the one that we're talking about, oh, about man. writing a covenantal. It, it's covenantal. And that's really the key thing about this document, Jeff, is it's a covenant document. It is a legally binding text in a literary chiastic format. So it's it's quite beautiful. 
Amazing. And all we have talked about up till now is the inside. So um, we'll be also releasing the writing on the outside. And it's taking us some time because we never thought there would be this many letters, you know, and there's, wow. there's so much on and each one has to be researched. We've got to get the parallels. We got to dot, dot every I and cross every T because, you know, if we make a mistake, it'll be the end of the world, you know? Uh, so we're just <laughs> making, a, making our list and checking it a hundred times. Now, uh, talk to me about the size of this tablet. Two by two centimeters. So you're talking like a little over an inch squared folded. If you were to unfold it, it would be four by two centimeters. Okay. So it, it's open, it's malleable. So that's why, you know, it's being inscribed. And incidentally, we, uh, we believe we've also found the stylus that wrote it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and we'll be publishing that as well. We actually have several apparent styli. Uh, used for writing. So there's evidence of literacy at an earlier period than than our liberal friends on the other side of the aisle have ever been able to recognize. What are these styli doing at Mount Ebal, you know, which is this very ancient site. Um, so, wow. you know, it's inscribed either with a lead, lead implement or an iron implement of some kind. Scott, this is incredible, and there's just so many things that you're that you're referencing that that are so huge. How is this find a, a game changer in the world of biblical archaeology? You know, I since I'm the the archaeologist in charge and found it, I hate to over overstate all this, but I can tell you what some of the headlines have said: um, um, biblical bombshell, uh, earthquake in archaeology. Um, uh, as big as the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, you know, wow. I, I don't want to put my neck out out there and, and say all that, but uh, let's just take all that together and say it's really big, you it's know, really on big, a scale yeah. of one to 10. This is a 10, you know. Uh, wow. Um, it, it's it's enormous when you're talking about the development of language. It's enormous for biblical studies, for cultural anthropological studies, our understanding of the Bible. So on many different levels. Um and I'll tell you what, I, I have, my inbox has been blown up with messages from people who have told me I was not a person of faith, but I'm rethinking my worldview now. Really? Wow. That's, that's incredible. I mean, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, that we exist as an organization, my, my organization, First Century Foundations, is to try and educate people about, about the connection between, uh, you know, Israel and faith and, and, uh, the, the early Jewish roots of faith. And we also talk a lot about, about how archaeology can help us uh, not only understand the Bible, but, but uh, see hints everywhere that, uh, that what the Bible says is true. And so to hear that, that you've got people reaching out to you that way, that, um, that's incredible. Now, what does this inscription mean to you personally? Okay, I'll tell you what it means to me personally. This is Scott separating uh, his faith from his, um, bifurcating his faith from his archaeological training. Let's just talk about me as a, as a believer, as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, it's found on an altar, Jeff. So half the tribes of Israel stand on Mount Gerizim, half stand on Mount Ival. The Ark of the Covenant is in the middle with the Levites. They pronounce blessings and curses, curses as part of a covenant renewal ceremony. Every one of them is going to be unable to keep the law. I mean, the point is, it's a self-imprecatory curse. They are binding themselves to, to the law of God. And in reality, they're not going to be able to keep it. Right. So what's going to happen? This is where the altar comes in. The altar is not on Mount Ebal. I mean, it's not on Mount Gerizim. The altar is on Mount Ebal, the place of the curse. Where did we find the tablet? On the altar on Mount Ebal. So the point is, through the shedding of blood, there is forgiveness of sin, Leviticus 17, 11. Mm -hmm. So if I will acknowledge my sin and come to the altar, those curses aren't coming upon me. So these are for the, the man who will not humble himself and receive restitution. So what does it mean to me personally? It's sort of this big picture that I know I'm messed up, okay? <laughs> I know we all are, but <laughs> yeah, me in particular, I know, I'm, I know I'm broken, okay? Um, that 
that I have a place, you know, the, the curse isn't upon, even though I've found the curse, the curse isn't upon me uh, because I do believe in the, the power of the shed blood and that there is forgiveness of sins through that. That's me personally. Now yeah. I've already talked a lot about what it means to me as an archeologist, mm -hmm. but uh, that's my personal view. Beautiful. And I, I love that because I, that was one of the things uh, even that we discussed with, uh, with Aaron was, you know, why? Why the altar on Ibal and not on 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 Gerizim? And uh, I, I love the the picture that you paint there, and it's uh, it really is an amazing thing to think about. Now, there are so many people out there skeptical of the historicity of the Bible. Forget forget uh, you know talking about this discovery right now, uh, but but as someone who works in archaeology and treasures the Bible, what kind of words of encouragement and and affirmation do you have for those who maybe doubt the truth found in the Bible? Can we trust the text? And and in your experience, has it proven itself to be true? Oh, absolutely. I think we have hundreds of synchronisms between the archaeological data and the biblical text. And take Mount Ebal, take the findings there, take Shiloh and what we are, you know, uncovering there, take our dig at Kirby Del Makata, biblical eye, if you will. At some point, it's it's like it takes more faith not to believe the Bible than to believe that it's true. Yeah, yeah. But you know, accepting this as historical fact is one thing. Okay, so Jesus was a real person. We could say, um, I could show you, I could prove to you that he existed, when he died, how he died, and where he died. But what I cannot prove to you is that he died in your place. Okay, right. so that's a matter of faith. Right. So we have these synchronisms between the archaeological data and the biblical text. But if someone is predisposed toward unbelief, you know, they're just going to, they're, they're not going to see it. Um, and others, I think, are predisposed toward faith. But then you've got about one third of the population that's in the middle and they're persuadable. They're open. And that's what I hope that the, those people will really take a good hard on look at this. And just because someone smart told them they couldn't trust the Bible doesn't mean that person was right. right. And I'm just saying, you know, can, can we talk about this? Let's engage in a dialogue. Um, and and give us a level playing field. That's good. I really like that. Uh, one of our friends, um, Danny Herman, likes to say this. Uh, you know, the the um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And uh, I, I'm sure other people say that too, but I've heard it mostly from him. What are we likely to find in Israel over the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years? I mean, there's just so much that's yet uncovered. We're in a golden age of archaeology right now. Um, we are accomplishing more than we've ever accomplished. Our technology is better. Our training is better. Our protocols are better. We have somewhat of a stable political situation, as stable as you know yeah. it can be, so that we can work. Um, so the future is very, very bright. Um, I think we have got to engage in this around this idea because the Bible has been marginalized right. and the Bible is our go-to source, Jeff. Yeah. You cannot deal with these. These sites are only mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. Mount Ebal is not mentioned in the Mesopotamian literature or the Egyptian literature. It is only mentioned in the Bible. Right. And so we have got to encourage a dialogue, you yeah. know, and I'm not saying, I'm not asking people to sort of, blindly say, you know, here's what the Bible says. And, and so it must be exactly like this, because sometimes we don't even know what those words mean in the Bible. You know, they're archaic words and we may be misunderstanding them, right. but I, I would hope we would have a dialogue. I think we are going to continue to, to find evidence of what life was like in antiquity in, in biblical times. Uh, Shiloh is a great example. We're uncovering that entire matrix of the sacrificial system. And over the next few years, you're going to hear a lot about Shiloh. It's going to be mind blowing as well. Oh, amazing. I can't wait. I, I've been to Shiloh and I've, I've been on Mount Gerizim. I've been in both places. And, um, you know, knowing what I know now, uh, and and thinking about standing there on uh, on Gerizim, you know, at the uh, at the ancient church site and looking down over over the valley of Shechem and and looking across to to Mount Ebal, man, it's it really is incredible to think uh, about the fact that uh, you know that Joshua's altar and now this inscription were found and how 
directly they link to the to the biblical the biblical narrative it's it really does blow the mind and uh and of course shiloh i just love because somewhere near where i stood you know the, the ark of the covenant stood for almost 400 years like that that in and of itself you know when we when we tell people to come with us to israel these are the kind of things that we want you to hear uh because you can experience that uh on your own and uh it would just yeah. be amazing for you to do that well scott thank you so much for uh, taking the time with us today and if people want to get in touch with you find out more information about what you're looking at studying where can they go well, thanks for asking. Um, I'm departing for Israel May 12th. I'll be there for seven weeks. We'll be in the field with a, a large team working away. People can follow along with us at digshiloh.org. Um, we'll be putting out a news channel called Shiloh Network News that they'll be able to pick up through YouTube and other places as well. Um, we can be contacted also through The Bible Seminary, which is my home institution. And uh, my personal website is scottstripling.net. Perfect. Well, we'll make sure that uh, those all get put up on the bottom of the screen if you're watching. And uh, for those of you uh, listening, I hope you uh, took careful note and uh, we'll, we'll encourage you to, uh, to follow what's going on. And I am excited to hear that you're going back to the Shiloh dig. I can't wait now to hear what some of these discoveries are going to be uh, talked about. But uh, again, thank you so much yeah. for being on the podcast today. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. You can listen to this entire podcast on your favorite audio podcast platform. Find the link below. And while you're at it, don't forget to click subscribe and follow us on Facebook so you can stay connected to First Century Foundations.